Good evening, everyone. Let's give a round of applause for all those amazing winners from visual effects. Welcome to the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, the largest museum in the United States dedicated to the arts, science, and artists of movie making. The Academy Museum of Motion Pictures acknowledges the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of the water and land on which we program, curate, convene, and discuss. We honor and respect Tongva ancestors and the Tongva community today, which continue to nurture this land and water through traditional practice, art, and activism. We also acknowledge their continued work to safeguard cultural resources. My name is Amy Homa, and I'm the Chief Audience Officer at the Academy Museum. Thank you for joining us tonight in our David Geffen Theater for the visual effects panel presented as part of our nominee programs. Nominee program support is provided by Clarendale and Domain Clarence Dillon, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures official wine, and I would like to give special thanks to Delta Airlines for the support of our Oscar season programs. I'd also like to thank our ASL interpreters tonight who will be assisting. Their names are Anthony Diaz and Richard Loya. If we could give them a round of applause, thank you. Before we begin our program, please silence, darken, and stow your mobile device. And now, please help me in welcoming to the stage the Chief Membership Impact and Industry Officer, Meredith Shea. Good evening. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. To our in-theater guests and those who are watching online, we're thrilled to be spending this night with you. Before I introduce the moderators, I wanted to personally congratulate all of our nominees this year. And I want to thank them for being a part of this process. Each of these films are unique. They have different techniques, budgets, genres, but the unifying factor is that the work is exceptional. So congratulations to all of you and your incredible teams. Speaking of teams, while I'm one person representing the Member Relations Global Outreach and Awards Administration team, I want to give a very special thank you to Natalie Wade and Clark Eglinton for their support of the visual effects branch and category, their dedication and hard work. This would not exist without the two of them, so I'd like to give them a huge round of applause. And I'd also like to recognize the entire member relations and awards administration team that they, they do work throughout the year to support this amazing process. And a lot of them are here tonight, so I'd like to give them a huge round of applause. I'd also like to recognize Academy CEO and President Janet Yang, who support all of our work year round. Without them, none of this would be possible. Nobody can do these events alone, and when I think of this incredible museum team and the collaboration that we've all gone through to produce 11 events in a matter of six days supporting all of our Oscar nominees, I'd like to just raise everyone from the booth to backstage that they've been putting this together. So thank you, everyone. And finally, to our Academy members who are part of this process from the very beginning. There is a submission form, and there's a statue, and then there are our incredible members who build the submission process, the eligibility, the awards and rules. I'd like to give a round of applause to all of our members who are here today who viewed and voted on all of our Oscar nominees. So thank you for being a part of this process. And in introducing our nominees, I'd like to just start by introducing our incredible moderators for this evening, Academy Governor Brooke Brenton. Brooke has produced um, visual effects films predominantly in live action, animated television series, theme parks projects. She's, she's done it all. She's received Academy Award nominations, BAFTA, Emmy, Annie, Visual Effects Society Awards. Her key projects include Avatar, Master and Commander, Far Side of the World, Sky Captain, The World of Tomorrow, Despicable Me, Minion Mayhem. These are minor titles, so just want to brace everyone for that. She's also been a key player in the startup of James Cameron's VFX facility, Digital Domain, and I'd also like to just recognize that she's the first woman to be elected to the Board of Governors for the Visual Effects branch. 
She currently serves as the Academy's VP Chair of Education and Outreach. She also serves on the Academy's Foundation Board, as well as the Scientific and Technology Council. Brooke does it all, everyone. <laughs> and now, um, Paul Debevic. He is currently the Chief Research Officer at Netflix Eyeline Studios, and he's an adjunct research professor at the University of Southern California. His work in image-based lighting, photoreal digital characters, visual, virtual production has received two Academy SciTech Awards, a SIMTI Progress Medal, and a Lifetime Achievement Emmy. His technology has con contributed to key visual effects sequences in The Matrix, Spider-Man 2, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Avatar, Gravity, Furious 7, and Blade Runner 2049. Again. Small titles, I'm not sure if anyone here has heard of them, but just wanted to read those out. And lastly, we have Rob Bredo. Rob is an Academy Award nominated VFX supervisor and his visual effects credits date back to Independence Day. He currently serves as the Chief Creative Officer of Industrial Light Magic and he's the SVP of Creative Innovation for Lucasfilm. He's the chair of the Academy Software Foundation which helped in collaboration with the Academy Site Tech Council and the Linux Foundation. Rob is a creative producer for a number of Lucasfilm's projects, including the most recent Willow, a Disney Plus series, and the new Disney Plus Star Wars series, currently in production. I am honored and privileged to introduce our three moderators for this evening, the current visual effects governors for the Academy. Come on out. Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to Academy members and guests who are joining us here today at the beautiful Academy Museum Geffen Theater. I'm Brooke Breton, Visual Effects Branch, and joining me this evening are my fellow Visual Effects Branch Governors, Rob Bredo and Paul Debevic. <laughs> we are delighted to host this evening to spotlight our five Oscar-nominated visual effects films from this past year. These films have distinguished themselves amongst a group of over 300 considered films where their ingenuity, technical execution, and artistry. Seeing a completed visual effects shot oftentimes belies the complexity of decision-making and inventiveness required to bring today's visual effects to the screen. That is why tonight is a rare opportunity to delve into the challenges, methods, and solutions that have yielded the astonishing imagery we are sharing with you this evening. In addition to hearing from our esteemed honorees, we are also pleased to welcome two very special guests who will further our understanding of the feats required to shepherd these films from inception to screen. Cool. So our visual effects branch arrived at these five nominees starting from over 300 of 2023's feature films eligible for Oscar consideration in the visual effects category. Our 38 member branch executive committee investigated and discussed every one of these films to arrive at a long list of 20 films through a series of confidential votes. For voting, we consider the contribution the visual effects make to the overall production and the artistry, skill, fidelity, and technical achievement with which the visual illusions are achieved. Each of these 20 films was invited to submit a three-minute making of reel, which the community viewed along with the films themselves to determine the 10 films shortlisted for a nomination. Then those 10 shortlisted films were invited to present their work in January in this very auditorium to our branch members here in the theater and watching on the live stream an event we call the Visual Effects Bake Off. Our entire branch membership, over 600 members, then had the opportunity to vote on the merits of each film's visual effects to determine the five nominated films which are here tonight. One of these films will receive the Oscar for Best Achievement in Visual Effects, voted on by the entire 10,000 strong membership of the Academy. And although the votes were cast earlier this week, the Oscar winning film will be revealed only at the Academy Awards a week from tomorrow in the Dolby Theater in Hollywood. So when people say, oh yeah, isn't it exciting? 
So when people say it's an honor to be nominated, just imagine getting through that process and what an honor it is to be nominated by your peers. And tonight we're here to celebrate these five amazing films that represent the best of the best of the work done in visual effects this year. So from the, from the seamlessly integrated AI robots and amazing technology added to, these, to those wild environments in the creator, to the remarkable destructive forces from the monster in Godzilla Minus One as he swims through visual effects created water and destroys visual effects created cities throughout the movie, to the opening 20 minutes of the film Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Volume 3, which was shot in a virtual motion capture stage and captured both James Gunn's unique style and the heart of the characters who are gonna kick off this giant juggernaut of a visual effects film, to the amazing special and visual effects that combine together to put our hero, Ethan Hunt, in eminent peril throughout Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I recommend you never get on a train with that guy. And finally, the seamless addition of thousands of infantry, cavalry, and even environments throughout the film Napoleon. Thankfully, no real stuntman had to be hit in the, in the chest with cannonballs to make the film. So five Oscar-nominated films, all seamless and fantastic work, illusions in service of storytelling, led by the creative supervisors and team leaders who, who you're gonna get to meet tonight. So with no more further introductions, let's dive right in. You're gonna, we're gonna kick off with one of those three minute reels and we're gonna start with our first nominated film, The Creator. The Creator was an ambitious and daunting project. We were to lean heavily into location photography and design futuristic science fiction elements in post-production, leveraging the beautiful and idiosyncratic nature of our locations. Director Gareth Edwards sought to keep the camera rolling for long takes without interruption. We built processes to execute with the minimum of survey and lighting reference data. In The Creator, humans and highly advanced robots called simulants live side by side. The simulants are a marriage of human performance with CG components. To allow maximum flexibility on set and reduce time and makeup, only a few tracking dots were placed on our actors. Heads and jaws were painstakingly tracked, partially removed, and using a combination of digi-double renders and reprojection techniques, robotic components were integrated into the performer's heads. Animation of the inner rings of the headgear was carefully crafted to communicate temperament and emotion. Building from the beautiful location of photography, shot in eight countries and 80 different locations in Southeast Asia, we built and extended a number of unique environments. A post-apocalyptic Ground Zero, Lilat City, a futuristic Asian city, an AI floating village, a robot monk temple environment, and future Los Angeles spaceport, among others. Environments were designed and built after principal photography, taking great care not to lose the unique and photographic qualities of each location. Practical locations were transformed into sci-fi settings. For example, a granary became the laboratory vault, and the Synchrotron Light Research Institute in Thailand became an AI lab that was building robots and simulants. The creator called on the visual effects team to model and simulate a diverse number of natural phenomena. Water and fire explosions, shock waves, targeting beams, hundreds of robots in a compactor, a wooden bridge destruction, to name just a few. Practical special effects were an essential component in creating our larger visual effects set pieces. Mortar pots, practical dust hits, and smoke were deployed on set and later supplemented with CG. Effects rigid body simulations guided secondary fire explosions and were coupled with countless layers of smoke, debris, and ground interaction impact simulations. A highlight of our work was the creation and destruction of the three mile wide space station Nomad. The creation of the Nomad was advanced in a virtual reality environment, allowing virtual scouting and rearrangement of the Nomad's components to aid in storytelling. Once the Nomad was built, camera work was established on stage using virtual camera operated by our director. Interiors of the Nomad were achieved with a mixture of CG extension work and virtual location work using ILM's LED volume toolset. The climactic end of the film is a massive double mushroom cloud explosion, informed by the atomic bomb tests on Bikini Atoll a fitting and exciting capstone to our almost 1800 visual effects shots. Thanks for watching.
I'd like to welcome to the stage two of the nominees from the creator, along with my fellow governors. They're, they're supposed to be here. I'd like to welcome to the, two of the nominees from the creator to the stage, visual effects supervisor Andrew Roberts and special effects supervisor Neil Corbel. And Andrew, you brought a special guest with you? That's right, yes. Uh, we have writer, director, producer, Gareth Edwards. I'm not that special a guest, by the way. Just lower expectations. Uh, you are to us. Um, so, Gareth, I'm going to start with you. Your process of making this picture was quite unique and a bit unconventional. Can you talk a bit about why you chose to shoot the film this way and your process of shot development as you developed it through post-production? Yeah, for those you know who don't know, what normally happens on a big movie like this is you design a lot of concept art and you show it to the studio. They get very excited about a film and they say, yeah, go make that. And then when you analyze that imagery, you can't go make that. So what happens is they build those sets the, in the foreground sets in a studio, and then you end up having green screen behind it, and you shoot the whole thing pretty much like in a sound stage. And it was, having done that a few times, it was like, when, I don't want to do that ever again. I really want to go to real world locations. And so essentially we went to seven different countries around the world, picked the best location for every scene in the film. We went to Indonesia, Nepal, Japan, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam. And then when we edited the film, we basically saved all that design that normally happens at the front till the end. And people like James Klein would basically paint over the frames and we would figure out what the world was gonna look like based on the actual footage we had in our hands rather than, so instead of trying to chase the footage, you know, basically chase the artwork, we were like basically, my best analogy is that if, if you imagine making a film is essentially drawing, painting, a a target on a wall and you stand back and fire an arrow and you try and get a bullseye. Our approach was, well, let's fire the arrow first and wherever it hits on the wall, we'll paint a target around it <laughs> and it'll just make us look really clever. <laughs> very cool, very cool. So um, one of the, the, the most uh, compelling effects uh, is the, are these humanoid robots and uh, a lot of them, they, 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 they have a hole right through their head. So uh, the actors obviously didn't have a hole through their head and a whole bunch of visual effects had to make that happen, and I think it involves tracking and lighting and figure out what you would have seen through that, even though the actor's head was in the way. How does that whole process work? How did you pull it off? And, and is there anything special you did in terms of how you did it for this particular film? Uh, yes, so the, um, the characters that we knew would be simulants, the, the highest form of, of AI. Um, we had dots that we would place on their heads um, so that we would be able to track the rotation and um, see where the skin wasn't sliding too much so that we would be able to uh, retain that, that performance. Uh, those primary characters, so Madeline Boyles and Ken Watanabe and a few others, we did uh, cyber scans of them so that we would be able to match the animation, their performance, then match that animation with the digital character and then use that as a starting point to insert the, the mechanics. Uh, there was a, a fair amount of work because of the fleshy movement and the, the organic nature of, of a, a face, but then when you move to the mechanics at the back of the head, that's rigid. And so there was a fair amount of work of figuring out how to transition and taper off that movement so that it didn't feel like a flapping sort of a jowly mask, but that it did feel uh, correct, like it was, was part of that, that robot. Andrew was actually very sneaky because one of the golden rules on the film was like, I don't want anybody to have dots on their face. Like, no dots. We're not doing that kind of movie. Andrew was our on-set supervisor in Thailand and everything. And on the first shot, I was filming Madeline, the little girl in the film, and I was looking on the monitor thinking, I don't remember having a freckle on her nose like that. <laughs> I, I don't remember having a freckle on the side. And I went up to the makeup woman and I was like, oh, sh um, she's supposed to be made in a factory. Um, could we just like paint out the freckles? And they were like, oh no, no, Andrew told us to paint them on this morning <laughs> so that they could track, track their head in the computer. So it was like, naughty Andrew. <laughs> I mean, the mandate for me was to stay out of Gareth's way that he was gonna shoot the film his way, but then do what I had to, to capture the information for ILM to be able to, to do their work. So just sneak sneaky. In a few very, nice very, work. very nicely done, Andrew. And now you've got an Oscar nomination out of it. So there you go. So yeah. 
<laughs> I forgive you now. <laughs> That's right. Um, it would be great to hear a little bit more about the cinematography on the film because it's so unique. It feels so in the moment. It almost feels documentary style, but it's this huge movie with all this technical complexity going on. Maybe a little bit about both Gareth from your perspective with a camera on your shoulder for all those hours every day. Um, how that, how your style of filmmaker, how your style of filmmaking really informed this picture, and then I'd love to hear Andrew how you were able to do your job around that technique because it's very different than a normal blockbuster shot. Um, yeah, I mean, it started off with a test. We, you remember, we basically we came to Industrial Light and Magic um, before the pandemic, um, and and we shot a little. 10 minute film where I essentially went to location scout. And so was, I shot this material of like monks going into temple ruins in Cambodia and guys on motorbikes in Vietnam. And, and I was like, can you please, please turn these people into robots? And everyone was like, oh my God, we have no data. There's none of those silly little silver balls. Um, but you guys managed to pull it off and made this really impressive 10 minute film that really like basically got the film green lit. And and it had such an arresting quality to it. There was like there was a shot in it where there's like this farmer and he was looking at me like, why are you filming me? Go away. And when we turned that guy into a robot, I was like, I've never seen that in a movie before. It was like so naturalistic and authentic. It didn't feel like a film or an actor. And I was like, if we can make a movie like that, then like I think that's something that doesn't exist on my Blu-ray shelf that could squeeze in there somehow. I think it felt like a bit of a safety net knowing that ILM were able to create such realistic visuals without having any of the material uh, that you normally would. And in preparation for going out on this film, your visual effects supervisor for Rogue One, John Knoll, he explained to me, I'm not gonna be able to capture everything and he prepared me for that. And the way that Gareth shoots, Gareth would reframe and perhaps you start off looking in this direction, but then he'd have the actors reset and then move around to the side. Then maybe now it's 180 degrees. So as I was taking notes and trying to see what would the background be, I realized that I'm gonna need to take more of a spherical approach to it. Um, capture a clean plate, uh, maybe take some reference photos, but that so much of it would be a trust fall to the amazing team at ILM led by our overall um, supervisor, Jay Cooper, and the rest of the team, the tracking guys, uh, the clean plate guys, that whole team would be able to recreate on top of whatever I was able to uh, capture. But again, it was let Gareth shoot his film and then see you know, what I'm able to, to, to do to support them. This Gareth guy sounds like an absolute nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I never want to work with him. <laughs> if only he would just stop making such great films. Exactly. So Neil, what was this like for you? You obviously created a lot of the atmospherics. You created a lot of the mood of the show. Tell us about your process. Yeah, so I've, I've worked with Gareth before, and um, I, I sort of know the way he works. So we knew it wasn't going to be a very big team going out there from, from the UK. We, we actually only sent two people out there from the UK, and we were only allowed to take one container, so we we had to jam as much as we could into one container. I mean, it was literally like a, you open the doors and everything would fall out. It was one of those. But we knew we were going to take a load of smoke, lo lo lots of mortar pots, hand ha handheld smoke machines and stuff like that. And it was literally, you know, we crewed up wherever we went to, um, with local crew. And it was literally, you know, my brief to Jonathan Bullock, who's on the floor for me out there, was... Don't wait, you know, don't be asked to do stuff, just put stuff in there, you know, explosions, smoke, wherever you could get it. Um, and then we had we had people in the shot as well with, with smoke machines, just, you know, because wind does funny things. And also Gareth shoots like 360 degrees, so everyone's going to be in the shot at one point. Uh, probably <laughs> turned into a robot as well. <laughs> they actually did. So, so I don't know if anyone saw the film, but essentially... There's these scenes where we needed to, we, we didn't actually close streets. We went to real bus depots. We weren't allowed to close the bus depot. And we were like, no, great, it's free production value. Let all the customers come in, it's fantastic. But then we needed to smoke it up. So we gave people sci-fi backpacks and they had smoke machines in their backpacks. And they would just walk and zigzag across the road and smoke up all the background. And it was insanity really, but we, we got away with it. And it looks really nice on camera. So I highly recommend it if you. Insanity works. Yeah. yeah. Quick, uh, quick, quickly to wrap up, uh, that explosion at the end, um, chilling, amazing, incredible scope. Um, how do you do that in visual effects these days? Huge computer simulations, software, I don't know, uh, generative stuff. Some 
uh, practical stuff? How, how, did, how did that really come together? Yeah, that was really credit to the ILM team in London, uh, Ian Comley and Charmaine Chan and, and their whole team. They uh, took reference of, there was the Bikini Atoll, the explosion there was a, a, a large part of it. But yes, a lot of simulation, it was all digital. So lots of reference and then, yeah, lots of uh, complex simulations to get that end result. Gorgeous work. All right, well, thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, let's give a hand for our panelists, Andrew, Neil, and Gareth. And now we're going to take a look at the next film, the visual effects from our next nominated film, which is Godzilla Minus One.通常日本映画には、ハリウッド映画のような潤沢な予算はありません。そこで私たちはその状況を逆手にとって、総勢直接アーティストと会話して各ショットを作り上げていきました。またトライアンドエラーの回数を飛躍的に増やすために監督が作業現場に常駐して、いつでもチェックできる体制を作りました。通常VFXは様々なデパートメントを介して完成していきます。しか
Welcome. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Welcome. Congratulations on your nomination and for an amazing movie. Thank you um, so much. Thank you. Uh, the, the character of Godzilla, obviously, focus point of the film. Um, it was amazing how this was a Godzilla like we've never seen before, but in some ways also very true to everything that we expect of Godzilla. It's like you cast Godzilla as Godzilla for this. Uh, can you tell us about the process of creating this character? How do you make a digital character that's able to do all of the things that Godzilla needs to do for this film? うん、コツというか、あの、とにかく、とにかくゴジラというものが僕らすごく、ゴジラの映画を作るということはすごく憧れでしたから、あの、ま、ゴジラ様に来ていただく以上、ゴジラが恥ずかしくないような舞台を設
So at first what happens is here's an animator, let's, let's say, and I'm trying to verbally communicate, okay, this is what I want, this is what I want to see. But you know what, at the end of the day, it's so much easier if I act it out myself. So that scene, so that scene where Godzilla just bites onto the train, what I did was there's a tissue paper box. So I just grabbed it and I said, this is how I want it to work. And so it's just easier, much easier to communicate directly to the animator. Yeah, and the animators were like, oh my gosh, surprise. Like, oh my gosh, got it. I got it. <laughs> だから最終的にはもう全身でゴジラになってあの演技したりしたんでほとんど子供の時にやってた怪獣ごっこと同じことをやってましたね。So <笑> you know what in the end as you can probably imagine I ended up basically moving my entire body around trying to act out what I want out of the animators and what I want them to see. So 今までもずっとそうやってきてるんで。ああ、いや、and <笑> as if you're a monster moving around in the sandbox. So that's what I've been doing throughout my entire life. And now it's really come to life and I can really use it as my skill. Oh, I love it. So Takashi and Kyoko, your team of 35 visual effects artists created 610 visual effects shots in eight months. And there's a number of artists here who would like to know, right? <laughs> This is a really small crew for those who don't know that. Um, so question from one of our other nominees, Theo, um, was he wanted to know how you distribute the shot work, such as animation, effects, lighting, and compositing, and were the artists doing all the work on their shots as generalists, or he was just curious how you broke the shots up? チームみんながそれぞれみんなジェネラリストなんですよ。なので、得意の分野っていうのがこうそれぞれのスタッフにあって、野島が pretty much everyone on our team is a, a generalist like you said. Uh, but each person obviously sort of overlaps or carries about maybe two or three of their niche, like specialized skills. So for example, Nojima here, a uh, compositor, but he also worked on uh, obviously the water effects. So yeah, each staff member has like maybe a two or three sort of uh, mini sort of discipline or skill that they really focus on, but they're all pretty much generalists to begin with. <笑>僕がやったやつですか。えっと、僕はえっと、実写のカメラにトラッキングが済んで、えっと、ゴジラのアニメがついた状態のあのデータをもらって、あとはもう全部海のシミュレーションとレンダリングとコンポジットまで全
And he's like, what do you mean like as a side hobby? Like that's a legit thing to do, show it to me. And so I went over and I took a look at it. It's like, oh my gosh, like why didn't you show with me this earlier? Like we could totally use this. So, you know, the more I see uh, of what he can do, the more work obviously I'm gonna give to him. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how he ended up working on that. Wise choice. Amazing. Well, let's give a hand to our amazing panelists and nominees, Takashi, Masaki, Kyoko, and Tatsuji. And now we'll take a look at the visual effects from our next nominated film, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. For Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, the VFX team delivered 3,066 shots, taking viewers on an emotional journey into Rocket Raccoon's origins. Some of the more touching moments in the film involved a young Rocket forming a deep connection with a group of test animal subjects. To capture this, we employed a virtual production approach. This technique allowed director James Gunn to quickly assess performances and camera coverage. 360 VFX shots, over 12% of the final count, were filmed this way in the first two days of principal photography. Digital versions of the cages sets were recreated with high fidelity to tie in with surrounding footage. This early start provided ample time to refine the animation and the look of the flashbacks, which constitute the heart of the movie. For the rest of the film, we used many different stuffies to help actors interact with Rocket more intimately than ever before. Rocket's animalistic features, especially his eyes, were meticulously recreated to convey intense emotions. Lila the mechanical otter, Tiff's the wheelchair walrus, and Flo the spider rabbit were all built with the same very high level of detail to allow for all the extreme close-ups in their sequences. In Volume 3, Groot has become a gentle yet burly young adult. James was keen to show us once again how he's supposed to move and dance. We also see him grow in many different ways. For Cosmo, we scanned a real dog, Slate, and match reference footage with the CG version to check fidelity. The film features dozens of other CG creatures, including Lam Chang, played by James Gunn himself. A crowd made of 604 CG furry animals escaped the spaceship in a series of shots so complex it took more than two weeks to render them. We used on-set performers in displacement suits to bring these characters to life. The film begins in nowhere, a gigantic space station built inside the head of a space god. Extensive environment work was required to expand upon a large multi-level set constructed in an Atlanta soundstage. The Guardians then visit Orgo Corp, a space planetoid made of grown meat, definitely not suited for vegans. Based on Seattle's layout and Atlanta locations, Counter Earth is where a series of action sequences constantly mix photography and full CG destruction and simulations. This finally leads to an exciting space battle between the glassy red Arete spaceship and the skull of nowhere, with massive crowds of swarming aliens attacking it. The one or nearly two minute long sequence is a combination of 17 takes, requiring constant switches between actors and digital doubles, CG sets and creatures. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is the fusion of high-end character animation, special effects, virtual production and CG world building. All these techniques and artistry contribute to an emotional and visually exciting cinematic experience. Thank you for your consideration. What a movie. That was. Oh, All right, do we have a mic? Thank 
Ah. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, so all of these films have been great. That one was especially good, in particular because um, it had characters that you just kind of fell in love with. It, it pulled on the heartstrings like, like nothing before. And it did that with completely digital characters. What's, what's involved, visual effects need to affect you emotionally like that? How do you pull that off? Uh, you know, it was Frame Store, uh, Alexis uh, Washbrot uh, team, uh, he's a visual effects supervisor at Frame Store. But um, he's explained uh, many times that it really, and stuff as well, that it's, it's reference and it's their history with the characters they were worked on it in the previous films. They were just kind of building on techniques that they had already developed. But he really emphasized, uh, Alexis did, was the eyes, was making sure that he spent an enormous amount of time making sure that you can, uh, you know, they can convey what their characters are feeling through the eyes. So they would do these uh, volumetric, I mean, these volume sims on the fluid and the meniscus, the fluid in the eye. So the attention to detail that they had was really, was really top notch. Um, and then also they're, they're relying heavily on, on the performance, both from Bradley Cooper, when he's reading the dialogue, and also uh, Sean Gunn, who's doing the, uh, he's actually acting out the character's motions on, on set as well. Very cool. And amazing makeup work to make him look like that, right? Exactly, as well. exactly. Absolutely. Um, obviously, all visual effects in that case. Um, you worked on one of the, the more fun sequences of the film where they go to Orgo Corp and you helped create this meat planet that people visit. Um, like, like what, what's it like when you, you know, get the, the email that says this is, this is what you're going to do for a while? And then how do you go about planning how to pull it off successfully? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, when you when you when you first are introduced to the film, it's usually you're you're bidding it, and so you see this concept artwork come in, and you see little script pages, and you're like, uh, an or a space station made of meat. I hope we don't get that sequence. That looks really hard, but um, uh, you know, you 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 look for those challenges, things that things that push you both creatively and technically, and and that was a very interesting one certainly to to tackle. Uh, they had great reference, um, this amazing artwork, but you know, of course, the, the artwork that the concepts of work that they come up with is very gestural. So when you look at it zoomed out, it, it, it kind of evokes like, oh, that's meat or that's bone. But then as you zoom in, you know, they don't have to get that 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 fine detail. But obviously in the film, you know, you're flying from far away all the way really close up. So you really have to do uh, a lot of homework. <laughs> And a lot of research. We spent so much time looking at, uh, uh, you know, surgery videos and things like that. Um, there was a time I think it was on, it was on Christmas Day. Even uh, I was making a coffee for someone in the family. You know, it was chaos. It's Christmas morning, and I knocked it over and I burned myself. I had all this water on, on my um, my sleeve, and it just it just stuck there, and the skin bubbled up in this huge boil and blister. And, my wife is like, you got to go to the emergency room. And I'm like taking photos of it, <laughs> <laughs> putting it up to the light and looking at how the translucency, how it goes, and then sending it off to Steph. I was like, is this, is this right? Is this the right look? You know? And he's like, just go to the emergency room. But, um, you know, I mean, like we're, we're always looking for those things and, and trying to find stuff that, because it's a very surreal environment. So you're always looking for something to ground it in. Um, and so, you know, whether it's your own injury or whether it's something you find online, which is constantly what we're doing. So. Very interesting. In that, that sequence, also, it looked like there was some some live action shot. Uh, some of the actors in the spacesuits, some real sets built, and then a lot of it augmented, uh, blended in with maybe some stuff even even replaced with CGI in in the process. How how did that marriage of the practical and the real go for that sequence? Yeah, um, they they made a decision to shoot, not shoot with a green screen or blue screen. Uh, we had characters wearing costumes that were those colors, but also it's a space scene, so. The sky is supposed to be dark anyway with stars, so it made sense just to shoot it black. Uh, minimal set. Um, the ground was just sort of this sort of orange peach color that was similar to the final look of this of the um, the meat. But they wanted something that was tactile that the that the actors could sink into. So we would actually be able to really reuse their footage as much as possible. And I'm sure, there's times where the wires that they're being suspended from are, are maybe stretching the suit wrong, and we have to replace them. And we're always adding CG visors anyway because they don't shoot with uh, glass visors. It's just a helmet that's open, so you don't have to remove reflections and things like that. So, you know from the from the onset, you you have to rotate uh, or match digitally every actor. Even if you're going to use the actor plate, you still have to add the digital visor. So you're always you're always doing that that work up front. Um, I think uh, it, it, and uh, and for going for CG, it, it it always helps to have something that's live action in the plate. 
Um, and it's what makes some of these movies so challenging is sometimes the whole world is synthetic. And so we're always so grateful for any piece of set we can use. So even in this case, we're gonna replace the ground. There's a lot of lighting cues you get from where the lights are and how the reflections of the characters, although we're gonna represent it differently on meat than we are on a plastic ground piece, it still was very informative. So it really helped us ground the characters having that practical reference in there, even though it was minimal. Very cool. So um, in a big um, visual effects movie these days, often uh, there'll be digidoubles created of the principal characters. And I think in that sequence, you probably use some, some digidoubles in the, in the sequence and in other places. What's it, what's it like for an actor to go through the process of, of you know, getting turned into a digidouble? And when do you use the real actor? When do you use the, the digital uh, actor? And then when would you use like a stunt actor, for example? Right. Well, I think the actors have gotten pretty used to now going into a, a booth and just getting a scan as an acquisition, uh, which is basically they stand there in a certain pose, and then there's cameras fire off, uh, hundreds of cameras fire off, and then we're able to use that data to recreate the model and grab textures as well, photographs for the textures. So they're really accustomed to it. Um, I, that would be a question I would ask the actors myself. Uh, I, I'm sure they all have their different modes of how to like sort of imagine that they're in this world and knowing that they're going to get replaced or, or partially. But uh, for us, you know, we try to hold on to the plate as much as possible. A lot of times, the stunts that they do are maybe are too dangerous, and they use a they use a, a stunt actor. Uh, but then they tend to shoot um, the scene again with a real actor so that we can take their face and paste it on top of the stunt actor. Sometimes, sometimes that works. Other times, it, it just makes sense, like if, if the arm is moving incorrectly, you try to hold onto the body and just replace the arm with CG. Other times, you just have to replace the entire character, especially if it's a, a, a fast action shot and it just didn't quite work the way you want. But, you know, uh, unlike any other movie I've worked on, um, James has a very specific vision. I mean, he, he writes the story, he, he boards it himself, and obviously he's directing, he's the director, but, um, you know what? What we get, and I like. There's is very it, intent is really there, and 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 if there is a plate shot for it, like generally we try to use it as much as possible, and 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 when we pulled it off most of the time. I know there are lots of cases, uh, especially in the big one or shot, when you have to do big handoffs between between shots. Sometimes you have to actually just switch to a digit double, but um, we've gotten pretty good at it. So you know, it's been, they pulled it off. Very cool. And so, and obviously, one of the, the most technically and, and, and uh, action astounding uh, sequences in there is that big one that's all in one shot. It goes on for over two minutes in a big uh, spaceship hallway and uh, to total melee between uh, clearly digital characters, some of the real actors, and I bet there's some digit doubles and stunts in there. Um, wh what can you say about pulling that kind of thing off? It's such an ambitious shot to do. Yeah, um, I, Guy Williams uh, was the VFX supervisor for Weta. Uh, he's kind of given me the brief on it, um, as, as well as Steph. I mean, that, that shot is so complex. Um, they devoted an enormous amount of time in pre-production, just meeting, having meetings with the stunt coordinators and, and James Gunn, trying to sort of figure that out. I mean, obviously, James had, he had a song in mind. Um, he had uh, certain beats. The, the whole thing is like, uh, choreographed to that song. Before. Right, correct, yeah. Which I think it, it, it is also gives it some guardrails, and so you know you have certain points in there that you want to hit on each song where you want to have one character be, be focused. So they had some of these very specific points that they needed to hit, um, which allowed them to do a lot of the planning around that, kind of revolve around all those little, those little end points. Um, so they had, I think they spent like six months in, in planning on that. Um, and then when it came time for the day of the shoot, you know, they was think it was done in three or three and a half days. So it was very intensive. They just they did it all at once. They did it in chronological order so that you only had to focus. You could be in the moment when you're on set and you don't have to worry about, oh, how is edit 16 and 17 going to work when you're, when you're working on, you know, the two and three. You only focus on the handoff between the ones that you're currently on and the next one. And that way you're just really zeroed in and focused on it. And so they shot it. You know, even sometimes it's maybe not the best way to shoot it just for like, oh, it might make, make more sense to shoot take four and seven because it's the same stunt rig set up. But they don't do that. They just did it chronologically and made sure that they could focus on each individual thing. So I think that paid off. And of course, there was, I think they spent eight months to a year on it in post and digital as well. So even though they had all that pre-planning, it still took that much time to fit it all together and get all the handoffs to be seamless. 
and getting those those time ramp like it goes into slow motion out of slow motion does that affect how they how they have to shoot it originally and then does it, it's got to affect the visual yeah work too? They, they shot at high speed so so every time they were doing match moves they were doing i think it was 120 frames a second so there are huge amounts of data to manage but they they figured out all that kind of time ramps and cuts earlier on so once they actually get into the there's a point where they locked off changes so that they could have like you know the last sort of leg of the movie like they know they're not going to change the edit that way they can really perfect the, the visual effects awesome okay well thank you very much congratulations to you thank and you. your whole team on your nomination yeah let's give a hand for the panelist theo and now let's take a look at the visual effects for our next nominated film mission impossible dead reckoning part one Our work in the desert involved augmenting the Abu Dhabi location and adding a digital sandstorm. We scouted and scanned a sand refinery in the UK to form the basis of our set extensions. The action moves to the Department for National Intelligence, where an effort is underway to transcribe the US's digital intelligence back into paper form. We shot the establishers at the Excel Centre in London with extras close to camera and populated the remaining space with digital extras. For the scenes of Benji defusing a bomb at the airport, we were granted access to a working luggage handling facility, allowing us to scan individual components. This allowed us to build out a digital version using a kit of parts approach, with Benji at its heart. For the Rome car chase, when Grace is driving, action vehicles prepared a reared pod driven BMW. We created a digital version of the car in order to remove the driver. Digital traffic, parked and moving was added to increase the sense of danger for other shots. Due to their cultural importance and fragility, we were not permitted to shoot on the actual Spanish steps. Our solution was to rebuild them on the back lot in two pieces, with a reinforced steel underlay to support the weight of the vehicles we would be sending down. VFX would extend the sets based on detailed surveys of the actual Spanish steps. To further populate the shots, we employed a combination of motion control crowds for close work and digital crowds for the backgrounds. For Ethan narrowly avoiding a collision with a Rome metro train, we shot multiple passes of action. We shot passes of an SFX Fiat collision, passes of Ethan and various spark and smoke passes. These were comped along with our metro train and tunnel extension. We shot the train sequence across multiple countries and years. Shooting started in Norway on a length of track which established the look of the sequence. During this time, we also shot array footage for our interior stage-based carriage work. We took extensive surveys of the area in forming digital environment builds. Production moved to North Yorkshire, which required us to augment the backgrounds with our digital environments. For the tunnel fight, we shot foregrounds on stage, with electrical giving us interactive chase lights for the red light signals, populating the run of tunnel. We then constructed a digital tunnel and steam simulations to wrap around the action. SFX constructed a working locomotive, which was fired into a quarry, forming the central element of the shot. We then produced detailed simulations for the bridge in the background. We made extensive use of gimbals for the slow motion train wreck sequence, extending with digital carriages and placing in our digital environment. The vertical carriage was achieved with another gimbal capable of rotating from level to vertical. This allowed us to shoot credible physical performances, to which we added set extensions as simulations for the tumbling furniture. I'd like to welcome to the stage one of the nominees from Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, Special Effects Supervisor, Neil Corbold. Okay, Neil. Me again. Yes. So far, two. Uh, let's talk about that little yellow Fiat. I understand you packed... Um, if I'm not mistaken, 500 brake horsepower into that little machine. I don't even know how that's possible. Yeah, so um, 
uh, Chris McCrory, he, he, you know, and Tom wanted to use this Fiat 500. They thought it'd be, a, you know, quite a fun thing to do. But obviously, Fiat 500s, you know, any, I think they're like 70 cc or something like that. <laughs> Very unreliable. Um, so we decided to put a, a motor in it, an le electric motor. Um, so, so we had a choice of like a, like a 10 horsepower or a 500 brake horsepower electric motor. There was not a lot in between. <laughs> Uh, and, and so we, we decided to go for the bigger and we could always tone it down. So, so that was the plan. So we basically cut everything out of the car. So the only thing that remained of the original car was the shell. Um, and then we reconstructed um, roll cages, uh, rally suspension, brakes, every, you know, completely built it from the ground up. And then the first day we tested it, it fripped the life out of me because <laughs> I was the first one to drive it and I just stuck my foot down not even thinking about it and, th and the thing just started spinning in circles. <laughs> so that scene you see in the movie, you pretty much did in real life. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, but we was on a big sort of airfield, so it was, uh, it, we had a lot of room to sort of uh, adjust it. So, uh, yeah, but we, then we just tamed it down. And then when Tom got in it for the first time, it was sort of probably a, a, about 90%. Um, and he just loved it. He just, you know, and I think McHugh, the director, I think he then sort of wrote a, a, a different thing for it because it became like a little character in the movie. Um, speaking of characters in the movie, you had to put, you know, your first team, Tom Cruise, Haley Atwell, in that car. And if I'm not mistaken, I just saw him get out of the car after it tumbled down the Spanish steps. And we do know that they like to do a lot of their own stunts. So how did you do that? How is it safe to put... First team inside a tumbling vehicle like that. How'd you pull off that illusion? Yeah, so we, we, we built a slightly, like, 10% bigger interior of the car, and then we had it in, like, a, a hamster wheel. Um, and then, so we literally put them in it. It was all padded, and we literally just rolled them, and, and, they, and, that, and they, did, they did the rest. You know, it was, it, was, it was that simple. It's old school, really. Seems very dangerous. Yeah, but Tom does everything, in, you know, <laughs> you and then go. and then Tom talks, you know, Haley into doing it as well. <laughs> That's so, perfect. Yeah, so you know, you just whatever Tom wants, you, you just go along with it. Just go along with yeah, it. Put some padding in there. That's it's it. ten percent bigger. It's safe, kids. That's it. Hop in. Yeah. So speaking of safe stunts or not safe stunts that you had to pull off, there's a very very famous motorcycle jump. We saw some pre-release material with that massive ramp. Um, I understand you guys. I mean, you guys built and planned this out with with stunts. Uh, well in advance. You want to tell us a little bit about that? That was such an incredible jump. Yeah, well, that that sort of all came about during during the COVID. They was always going to do a jump, but then when we when COVID hit, we 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 basically didn't stop work. We were doing meetings, Zoom calls, and trying to figure out the 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 angle of the ramp, how how far they they picked the location in Norway, and then it was really you know how far can we go before we hit the the rock face, so we needed to, you know, Tom needed to get out far enough where he wasn't going to hit hit the hit the rock face. So um, that seems important. Yeah, and then we we did some we did some uh, uh, computer simulations. So you know, we built the bike, we built different types of ramps, different angles, different lengths. You know, we knew we had a, cer a, a certain amount of, of distance at the top of the mountain, and then we just literally, you know, w we did the simulations until Tom was happy with it. Um, and uh, yeah, and then Tom just got on a bike and rode it off the mountain. Yeah, it's like. And he did it like seven or eight times. Seven or eight times. Yeah, yeah. he just wanted to keep going. I Different think. angles, yeah. you know, faster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it was, it was. It was sort of. A, you know, it really was a heart-stopping moment seeing him go off the, the mountain for the first time. Yeah. They they did a lot of rehearsals, so they built a, a complete ramp um, in a quarry um, just up the M4. Uh, and you know, and they had big cranes and cables above it, to, so so Tom could get a, a, a an idea firsthand of of how fast it goes. He he doesn't have speedometers. He he, he just knows the speed that he needs to go at uh, to to make the distance. You could have given him a speedometer. He he d he won't have one. Okay, he, there you he go. doesn't want one. No, he, he he had to do it the way. He he felt yeah. Tom, you know, he he you know he does it his way. And and because he's the guy that's driving it off the mountain. Yeah, he's and the stunt person and the actor. Yeah, he's you know so it, whatever Tom wants, he gets. We give it to him. It's amazing. So uh, this movie has a huge sandstorm in it. There's so much work in this movie, we can't see it all in the three minute reel. Right. Uh, so um, so they need a big sandstorm. So uh, and I understand uh, to you that meant you'd use like the biggest wind machine you could 
make, which was a, like a jet engine or something. I, I'd like to know the process that goes through your mind, Neil, when, when someone says sandstorm, you're like, yeah, I've got a jet engine. It's just the thing. That, that was basically it. Yeah, so, so McHugh sort of came in and said, well, we, I'm doing this sandstorm. How, how, what, what, what do you think? I said, well, well, actually, I've got a jet engine up on the shelf. I'll, I'll, he said, really? I said, yeah, now we've got a jet engine. He said, let's bring it. Let's take that out. We took some V8s out there. Um, What's a V8? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, um, a swamp boat uh, engine. With I was big, just asking for it. Uh, you know, big, big propeller. Big uh, propeller. It's like 10, that, 8 foot. Yeah, that's yeah. about 400 brake horsepower. So we took two of those out into the desert and... Uh, yeah, the, the jet engine, we actually ruined the jet engine because it was sucking sand in at the back and it basically sandblasted all the impellers. So at the end of They're it... made to fly airplanes, not make sandstorms. No, that's right, yeah. So we found that out the hard way <laughs> and uh, we ended up chucking it in the skip at the end of the film. Oh, but man. at least we got the shots. Yes, well, that worked. Okay, so the train sequence, full scale, uh, what we can see in the reels, full scale train parts... One and a half train sections, I think, at, at moving at huge angles. I mean, what are some of the rigs that go behind that? Well, first of all, we, we built a train from the ground up. Um, and, and originally, we built it just to run off of a private railway. And, and we were trying to blow a bridge up. We were trying to find somewhere in Europe or around the world where they had a, a bridge that nobody wanted, and we were going to blow it up. <laughs> As you do. And we got very close to it, but then that, that fell through. So we... Yeah, Stuart Heath was sort of he he led the the build of the of the train, and and then then McHugh said, well, I but I want to use it in Norway, so that that on a public on a public railway, so that threw a whole lot of uh, accreditation that it needed, so it needed to be a real train, so we had to do the brakes, we had to do the uh, we had to do a decoupling thing where if it ever left the the the, um, the the diesel that it would actually stop, we had to have things in place where if it did run away, we had to derail it. So it was just an amazing amount of work. And then, and then we had these different rigs as well. We had uh, so everything. All the carriages were eighty feet long, uh, and we had one that went from from uh, horizontal to vertical, eighty feet long. Because you know Tom wanted to be up eighty feet. It was actually about a hundred feet because we had all the mechanism underneath to to raise it up. And I hope like a thick mattress at the bottom. Yes, yeah. yeah, and big, thick wires to hold, <laughs> to hold them up. Yeah. Amazing. Just incredible scale of all of the special effects. So I, I understand, in addition to you and your team, um, this movie, of course, had a big stunt team. It had, I guess there was over 3,700 digital visual effects yep. in the film. Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with, vi with the digital visual effects team and the stunt teams and some of those, you know, maybe a story or something that's, that, that typifies that for you? Yeah, well, w w Wade Eastwood, he's, he's sort of the action uh, second, you know, he's the stunt coordinator, but he's also an action director as well. He, you know, everything goes through him. Um, we work very closely with Alex, the visual effects, and, and, and his team. And basically it was, a, it was, let's shoot it as much as we can in camera, and then they'll pick the bits up that they need to change. Um, and, and, and McHugh as well, you know, he just wanted to shoot stuff as, as practically as we could. So, you know, on top of a real train going at, 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 at uh, 60 kilometres an hour down the, in Norway. Um, but the, the, the best thing, I, the thing I love the most is when we dr drove the bridge off the end of the, off the end of, uh, drove the train off the end of the bridge. And, you know, it's, it's a one take. And, and once the train's moving, that is it. So, you know, we had 14 cameras on it, helicopters flying around, and we just had to make sure it's a sort of mic drop moment at the end of it where everything... Everything went to plan, and I had to place a cone in because McHugh said, "Where's it going to land?" And I've got this cone, and I stuck the cone because we'd done all these computer simulations as well, and it hit smack, smack bang on the cone. It was destroyed that cone. It, we did, yeah. yeah. We didn't like that cone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> amazing. Well, let's give a hand to our panelist, Neil Corbold. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Uh, now we're going to take a look at the visual effects from our final nominated film, Napoleon.
Battles and buildings. Ridley Scott's own storyboards guided us while 18th century paintings led the aesthetic. The goal, shoot real special effects wherever possible, keep the VFX invisible. The battles, epic in scale, demanded exceptional levels of detail. Toulon's night shoot has skies based on paintings of the time and a finely detailed fleet of 100 CG tall ships. Quarter scale miniature ship rigging was used for the burning sails. We had one real ship and a mix of LED firelight panels and practical explosions. The Battle of Austerlitz was shot over three locations that had to be weaved together. On the shoot, we used real-time virtual previews to correctly align the cameras. Special effects dug tanks into the airfield, some covered with fake ice that could collapse on cue. Elements under the ice were shot in a tank at Pinewood. Ice explosions mixed practical with digital simulations. 700 live infantry and 100 cavalry were meticulously scanned and copied to create highly detailed digital armies numbering in the tens of thousands. The film's effects were practical based to an epic scale. We shot all the action on real locations with special effects and hundreds of stunt performers. This deeply grounded the digital world into the realism captured on camera. Motion capture covered over 30 different military maneuvers. Hand animation was required for the falling horses and the challenging variety of horses and rider gates. In-camera effects included filming an HDR monitor with telescopic optics. Digital gore was added where Ridley wanted to show the brutality of the battles. 14 practical cannons were rigged to kick back and fire a plume of talcum powder. VFX then copied these to create hundreds of firing cannons, simulated muzzle flashes and digital cannonballs to fly through the air and synchronize with the practical air mortars that were built into the set to safely explode right under the stock. With Ridley's preference to shoot real buildings over blue screens, Blenheim Palace in England was used as a stand-in for both the historical Tuileries of France, along with its gardens and Paris backdrop, and the Kremlin in Russia. We hired an architect to best guide us how to augment the architectural styles and keep as much as possible of the original buildings. The conquest of Egypt was shot in Malta, on a polo pitch and in a quarry. Background plates shot in Morocco were combined with CG pyramids and dust effects. The Sphinx was a model and a traditional matte painting based on an 18th century painting Ridley loves. Thank you for your consideration. We would like to welcome two of the nominees from Napoleon, Production Visual Effects Supervisor Charlie Henley and Special Effects Supervisor Neil Corbold. <laughs> welcome back. Welcome back. And Charlie, you also have a special guest. I do, a very special guest, our esteemed production designer, Arthur Max. Welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think I came on the wrong night. <laughs> <laughs> no, Not at all. You, you came on the right night. Um, so, Arthur and Charlie, you went to England, Malta, to shoot a film that needed to replicate 18th century France. Talk to us a little bit about your collaboration and bringing those sets to life. And those it wasn't my choice to be <laughs> shooting in England, so I'll pass that to Arthur. Uh, well, uh, as it happens, I mean, the, the obvious choice would be to go to France. Um, it's kind of uh, a bit of a bete noir for the French that we made it uh, mostly in England and Malta. Um, <laughs> we did have a couple of Frenchmen just, you know, for credibility in the art department. <laughs> uh, but uh, in the end, it turned out to be the right decision. Um, the challenge for me and with um, visual effects 
uh, helping me a great deal was um, creating uh, French architecture out of English architecture, um, particularly in the big uh, set pieces like the Guillotine Square, which we, we shot in Somerset House. Uh, the roof, uh, everything was you know, compatible with French architecture except the roof lines, which um, were changed. And, and I wanted, as production designers tend to do, I wanted six ships to begin with and 30 cannon. Um, but the producers, as producers tend to do, um, cut me down to, uh, I think it was 10 cannons and one ship. <laughs> uh, and, you know, um, we shot it, you know, so many angles with so many riggings uh, and different dressings and flags. And it just shows you, you know, the efficiency of what you can do with very little. Um, these days, I come from, um, you know, uh, an ancient background in visual effects where uh, glass paintings were still being done and um, uh, forced perspective sets were being built. Uh, so it, uh, it's been very interesting and a great ride to uh, come along with the progression of technologies. Um, and we work hand in glove. We do previs, um, concept drawings, and hand them off. Um, Charlie, I think, did a lot of animations from our original uh, stills. Um, yeah, we really, I mean, we had the, all these buildings as a basis, and we shot everything on location, which really helped us, as you see with the thing, like, it helped us ground everything in reality. And in the end, that was great for me that we weren't in studios. Um, but we, uh, Arthur supplied all sorts of concepts for every scene, like incredible drawings about what the final image should look like, and that was our kind of key guide. Um, as he said, the roofs were a big one, just, to, just adding a French-style roof helped most of them. Yeah, I mean, art, art, architecture is my bag, and, you know, um, it, it's kind of uh, it opens the, the scope of what you can, you can um, do and where you can do it. For instance, um, we shot Blenheim Palace for, I think, three different locations, including the Kremlin, uh, <laughs> which even Ridley, who's, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of very um, ready to you know, push the envelope. He said, really? <laughs> <laughs> that was and actually a real, uh, that was the exciting challenge for us, was we've got one building, how are we going to make it three different <laughs> yeah. locations? Yeah. And uh, lots of little tricks, like boarding windows up for one scene, changing the color on the other scene, uh, you know, building different, lots of top-ups. We kept the base level of a lot of buildings in the ground and then did the top half. Yeah, it was obvious to me. <laughs> <laughs> But it just shows you, shows you what you can do with, you know, integrating um, uh, many departments, not just, you know, ours. Um, I mean, Napoleon was, it was more like going to war in a Napoleonic campaign. Um, I called it um, bloodbath in a mud bath. <laughs> um, but, you know, we were in England and the weather was not conducive to do anything, really. But... <laughs> Um, the scale game that we played with the Battle of Austerlitz and the Ice Lake, uh, we were on an airfield, which was, you know, a big, open, flat surface because we needed flatness for the Ice Lake itself. Um, but it was quite small. I mean, it was only a couple of hundred yards across. Uh, and Ridley was talking about, you know, a f lake of five miles. It also incorporated uh, another location, um, in Bourne Wood, which is a forestry commission location, which is very hilly and like the, the mountains of Austria, which is where we were supposed to be. Um, we had to, you know, stitch those two together um, and play with the scale, which is something we would never be able to do previously um, in olden times, where I come from. <laughs> Speaking of putting enough soldiers in the shot to go to war, I mean, we see, we've seen it in movies before, so maybe an audience might take it for granted, but there's thousands of digital troops that are indistinguishable from the hundreds of extras on the set. Um, there's a huge amount of cannons, and it, you know, if you had the 16, all the rest had to have been digital. Um, can you let us know about some of the detail that went into cr creating and, and the collaboration between the departments, but also just creating the level of detail in those characters so that it could be completely seamless like it was? 
Um, well, we we had some we had a lot of discussions about how many real people we would get and and debates over pushing it. You know, it was I'd go to a meeting. The first meeting would be there's like a thousand, and the next meeting, oh, now we're down to three hundred, and I have to haggle back. And we got we got I managed to persuade everybody that for these uh, for the um, squares we needed a full square, and the historian backed me up saying a full square would have been five hundred people. So we we got a max of five hundred people. Um, the costume department did an incredible job of of making super complex, highly detailed costumes, where even like the uh, all the French troops had different trousers because historically they had to supply their own trousers. So we thought we were going to be able to like dupe, you know, make one and create a thousand. And it's like no, you got to like like at least forty different people just to create, you know, make it look work right. So so we did. We had something like. Um, we we made probably about 300 different digital agents and then combined a lot of technology to try and make them all look very individu individualistic and the same with the horses so there was a lot of complexity there and added a lot of work and the motion was another part of it <laughs> so i have a a, a question uh from uh theo biolic from the guardians group uh, and it uh, has to do with these uh, digital doubles. and also has to do with the fact that for big movies like this, actually, oftentimes the visual effects are done by many different visual effects companies. Uh, how many did you have in, in this film, by the way? We had eight different companies wow. uh, doing different roles on this film. And um, the question would be, uh, since you had different companies working on different battle scenes, uh, but they all involve French soldiers, um, to what degree were the different companies able to share like motion capture data that would have been acquired for the project, and were they able to share, you know, just the, the skeleton motion, or also things about the costumes, or the cloth simulations, or the shaders, or uh, to what degree were people able to share these kinds of assets? Um, well, we we divided uh, different vendors had different battles, so there's four main battles, and there were four separate vendors, and they, there's some overlap in the French troops, but mostly they had distinctive costumes for those battles. Um, but for the motion capture, we we did about two weeks motion capture on a on a motion capture stage, and then we spent some time at the the horse uh, place doing horse horse capture and riders on horses, which was a particular challenge. How um, do the horses so like the ping pong balls? Do they care? The little <laughs> they, markers. They, they loved them, but they they would they would fall off a lot because they get sweaty in this place. Yeah. I don't know. But they, but the motion capture side of it was shared, so we processed all the actions. I mean, there was repeated actions for a lot of the movements of the different armies, right? Like the way they shoot and stuff. So we shared a lot of that. Um, but the horses proved kind of the biggest challenge, and I think we, the, the two main companies, ILM and MPC, doing horses, did a lot of custom stuff for their particular horses to try and match the real ones. Mainly like secondary motion, like tails moving, and and the, the all the different gates, like five different horse gates, and the fact that they were riding down slopes a lot meant that you know that was it was very custom, tricky stuff to do. So Neil, atmospherics played a huge role in this picture. Tell us a little bit about how you worked with your team as well as with the visual effects team to keep continuity and you know, develop the atmosphere. Yeah, well, <clears throat> any Ridley Scott film's got loads of smoke and, and stuff in. So yeah, it was literally we put, we probably had uh, we must have had forty people on the floor on that. But we had trucks with big smoke machines, handheld guys running around, um, lots. So then we 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 also did some uh, talcum powder cannons, air cannons, for for so we could get people around them. So we instead of firing black powder, which we did as well, but we when we had people around we used to fire compressed air and, and talcum powder out the end which gave you actually gave a really nice smoke did you get to use a jet engine on this one yeah. did you get to use a jet engine on this one no no oh. it was broken it, it was, was already skip. broken okay <laughs> <laughs> well we want to thank charlie neil and arthur special guests for joining us thank you all yes. my pleasure and a special congratulations some of you astute viewers have noticed neil has been up here three times the first ever uh, a visual effects nominee has been nominated for three movies in the same year. Congratulations, Thank Neil. You. Thank you.